It's October 6th. Some of you know where I'm going to go with this. Others you don't, and you can boo me later. But listen, summer's over. Let it go, all right? It's like the girlfriend that you thought was perfect at summer camp, and then you realize she really wasn't that perfect. You were just like, it's time to move on. And here's why it's time to move on. Some could argue that fall is the greatest season of the year because it's the most beautiful time of the year. It is, right? It's just trees are changing. But all fall does is just prepare us for the greatest time of the year, which is winter. Winter's, don't boo, who booed me? You can't boo me. That's security. All right, so I was reading on the Farmer's Almanac this week. I don't even know who this farmer is that does the almanac, but listen, I love his prediction. This is the prediction for this year. Above normal temperatures, everyone should be happy with that, right? But above normal snowfall, which is yippee for me, right? Like we get more snow, so it's not as cold, but it's beautiful. And then it gets even better. It says Ohio is just going to get dumped on, which is great because no one really likes Ohio anyways, right? (laughs) All you Michigan State fans are like, woo! All right, I'm just joking. I'm sure God loves Ohio people. Um, Last week, Nate did a great job. talking about some very difficult and controversial topics. And remember what he did. He asked us a bunch of questions, and he asked us to weigh in on those questions. Do you remember how unified we were on that? Not so much, right? We all really quickly learned that we all have our own mindset of what we think is right. This week, uh, Nate and I were in the office, and we ranked the top three Little Debbie snack cakes, in case you're wondering how theologically deep our conversations are during the week. Uh, and, uh, and we didn't have the same answers, not even for the top three. And so I was actually texting back and forth with Phil, and I, I asked him his thoughts. And he and Nate both had Nutty Buddy as the number one. And I was like, you both are skinny. Like, you don't even know what you're talking about, right? Like, I am clearly the winner on this. And just if you guys are wondering, right? It's a Swiss cake roll. Swiss cake rolls are, thank you. They're always good in the fridge, in the freezer, outside the fridge in my mouth like they're always I love you can you can give me boxes of them the point is we're all we are all very unique aren't we we're all wired very differently Uh, but similarly with one goal and that is to serve our creator worship him but none of us are the exact same I think about identical twins we have a couple sets of twins in our church um, and and they look like a mirror image. Like the Dykstra twins, I have called them by the wrong name so many times. I feel bad every time. I'm like, I just can't tell. They're like that. But when you get to know them, what you do is you find out they're very unique. They have uh, their own makeup. So what I want to talk about this morning is that every single person in this room, every single person in this world has a story. And your story matters. It's powerful, and it's unique, and it's yours, and it's what shaped you into the person that you are today. Now, some stories are not easy to talk about. You have to relive past pains and trauma and hurts, but I am telling you, your story has to be shared, because even though you are unique, and God wired you one way, the world's so big that somebody else is going to have a very similar story. And you're going to have a connection with that person that I probably never would have a connection with. Like in this room right now, I'm a preacher's kid, have lived a a Christian life pretty much my whole life. Here's the few people that I know of that I can have a a certain kind of relationship with that I can't with everybody else. Uh, Dan Hamilton, uh, Maddie, Roman, Phil, we're all preacher's kids. We all know what that's like to be raised in a preacher's home. So we have a, a connection that everyone else will have won't have. Uh, And our stories can sort of seem boring. They can almost seem ineffective to some degree. And I'll talk about that later and how that's a lie from Satan. But in this room right now, uh, we have stories of addiction. We have stories of trauma. We have stories of triumph. We have stories of failures. We have stories of people who have been incarcerated. We have stories of people who have lived goody two-shoes lives. And we are reminded of just how unique each one of us are. And yet we have two common denominators. Those two common denominators are this. We are created in the image of God. His DNA is all over you, all over every single person. And then the second thing is that we are just sinful by nature. Like none of us can come to God and say, I've earned salvation, that I've earned this relationship status. It's by grace through faith that we know him, and even better yet, that we are known by him. We all have a story that matters, and the only time Please hear this. The only time your story is ineffective is when you don't tell it. That's it. It's the only time. 
It's that powerful because as you'll hear later on in this service, it's God's redemptive story. I want to look at a few passages in the Bible. They'll be up on the screens. I'm going to look at Mark 5, Mark 7, and then John chapter 4. It's a decent amount of reading, but there's a lot that I think we can learn from these three different instances in the Bible. The first one is Mark chapter 5. It says, They went across the lake to the region of Gerenthinus, sure, uh, where Jesus got out of the boat. A man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This sounds fun. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore his chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with the stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran, fell in, on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? The man, uh, My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send him out in the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding nearby the hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. That's a lot of bacon, church. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they uh, came to, to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were what? They were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. He's like, you just killed a bunch of pigs. Like, there's no reason for that, and that's how we make money. And Jesus was getting to the boat. The man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him go, but said, go to your own home or to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell uh, at the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were what? Were amazed. Why were they amazed? Because they knew his story, right? Right? that he was demon-possessed, chained like an animal, forgotten, unwanted by the world, harming himself, just wreaking havoc over on the side of a hill, playing like jumping out of a tomb like a crazy person. And now he's talking to people about the greatness of Jesus Christ. And I was thinking about this story this week. I mean, it's like you grow up around this guy and you're like, you know, it's, it's over on that hill. You know the crazy guy that lives on the side of the hill? It's behind him. Like, that's how you would probably relate. You would tell your kids, it's like a horror flick. Don't go by there. This guy's crazy. And now you're in the city, and you see him, clearly and visibly different than you've ever seen him before, proclaiming the goodness of Jesus Christ. And people believe because they knew his story before, and it's no longer the same story. Mark chapter 7, verse 31. I'll give you a second to turn over there. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon, down the Sea of Galilee into the region of Decapolis. There some people brought him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. After he took him aside away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ear. Then he spat uh, and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven with a deep sigh, said to Apathaphatha, probably not saying that right, but I'm trying, which means be opened. At this time, the man's ears were open, his tongue was loosened, he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with the, uh, remember the word again, amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. A man that's deaf and mute would be considered worthless in that culture. Anyone with ailments in that culture was not taken care of by any means, usually considered cursed, and he had probably had a title of worthlessness, and now he can see and speak very clearly. It's a magnificent scene to behold, and I love what Jesus says. He says, don't go tell anybody about this, but the story can't, it can't be confined, can it? Because people knew his story before, and now he's talking, so something had to have happened. Now he sees, and his story speaks for itself, and it says people were overwhelmed with amazement of his story. 
In John chapter 4, last week, Nate referenced the woman at the well. Amazing story about how he had, was sitting there talking to her, and he tells her about her five husbands that she had had, and that the man she's living with now is not her husband. And he kind of calls her out on our life, and then he still says this. He says, I can give you life from a well that doesn't run dry. And she says, well, I'm sure hoping that one day we see the Messiah. He's like, you're, you're talking to the Messiah. We find this later in that same chapter. She comes back on the scene. It says, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. Let's just stop and think about that for a second. That must mean that Jesus knows everything she ever did, right? And yet he offers her life. That would forever change her. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. It sounded like they did believe at some point, right, because of her testimony. But now we've actually seen it. We've heard it for ourselves. We know this man really is the Savior of the world. This lady has a lifetime of guilt and shame with with failure after failure trying to define her. And when encountered with Jesus Christ, it forever changes the course of her life. It changes her story. She said, he told me everything. I love that part. And yet he loved her. And so what she wants to do then is tell everyone about that encounter. So, all right, church, what are the common denominators in these stories? Sinful, broken, abused, hurt, unwanted people when encountered with Jesus Christ are forever changed they no longer have the same story because our God changes the story he rewrites the story I said a few weeks ago that the gospel is too powerful it's too holy not to change you an encounter a true encounter with Jesus Christ will change you it will it's too powerful it's too holy he rewrites the story now this is only three of hundreds, hundreds of stories in the Bible of life-changing stories of when God just shows up and does these miraculous things while we encounter uh, Jesus and changes us to the point where we want to tell people about that, it doesn't mean that we get life without difficult times, does it? Right? That's not what it's saying. The question is, can we use the difficult times, the difficult seasons, the past trauma, the stuff that we've went through, can we use that for his glory? Does your story really matter? I'm here to tell you it does matter, but we have to look at it. We think about Paul referenced it as thorns in his flesh. Can those thorns in our flesh that want to define us so badly, can they be used for his glory? When I was 12 years old, I... uh, I was a normal 12-year-old boy, which means I, I stunk. <laughs> and I played all the time. Back then, there was, no, there was no devices, right? So you just played outside. And so I played all the time. And I was at church camp in 1985. I'll never forget it. I had played all day long to the point of exhaustion. I mean, that's what church camp does. You just get worn out. It's so much fun. But the next morning when I woke up, my ankles, both of them had swollen huge, and they were locked in place. They would not move. And I couldn't walk. And I had this for almost a week straight. My parents took me to specialist after specialist. Over the course of about three months, I went to almost every doctor you could see for this young 12-year-old boy that now couldn't walk like a normal child. And what they did is they took a bunch of tests, and what they came with, they don't even know if the diagnosis was right, but it was such a rare thing. They said, we believe it's some sort of rare case of JRA, which is juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. But what they couldn't explain is how it happened overnight. Truly overnight, like it just, so the year before that, I had been diagnosed, I got really sick and ill, and they, they thought I had scarlet fever. I almost died, I was a young kid. And, and the year before that, they thought, well, maybe they misdiagnosed that, maybe I actually had Lyme's disease, and this was part of that, so no one really knows. But here's what we do know, for 34 straight years, I have taken medication every day of my life to be able to walk. You probably didn't know that. This is what they told the doctor. The doctors told my parents. They said, the case is so severe that by the age he's 40 years old, he'll be in a wheelchair. He'll never be able to play sports. And I'll beat all you guys a ball right now. Right? (laughs) Maybe not Nathan. I love you. Please don't take it out on me. Um, The point is, it it was that severe. I have to have my my, uh, liver 
checked on an annual basis because I have to take so much heavy anti-inflammatories. And for the most part, I live with pain. I'm somewhat used to it. You get used to pain. A couple years ago, medication's gotten better and better, and I started a new medication that's changed my life. Like, I'm not in near as much pain as I used to be in. But when I was in my 20s, 30s, and even up until just a couple years ago, I mean, I was in excruciating pain. Excruciating pain. There was a time when I was in my late 20s, I was at work, and at lunch, I went and played basketball. And I came back and then finished my shift at work. And when I left to leave, I couldn't walk. And I crawled, hands and feet, to my car in the heat of the summer on a gravel driveway. People watching me like a little baby. It's been humiliating. It's been a lifetime of pain. But what it has done is given me a unique perspective for those who are in physical pain. See, I have an empathy for people who hurt physically like someone that has never experienced that. Like I truly hurt for that. Because I know what it's like. I'm often still there. I don't share any of that to make you feel sorry for me. Not at all. I share that. The point is, arthritis is just part of my story. It's a pretty big part of my story. I'm reminded of it every single morning when I take medicine. But it doesn't define me. I'm defined by Jesus Christ. Arthritis is just part of my story. So can I use that for God's glory? Absolutely. I can find compassion for those who are hurting. Our stories are incredibly powerful because what has shaped us can be used for his glory. What I've learned is what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And there's some truth to that. But I've also learned that everyone is fighting some sort of battle. Everyone. Not always physical. Everyone's definitely fighting a spiritual battle. So tread lightly. Tread compassionately. Love people. God does not make our lives perfect in the here and now, but he does change our stories. Three stories that I read this morning. Demon possession, chain, utter torment to freedom and a life of mercy and grace. Jesus takes the blind man and the mute man and allows him to see and speak clearly. And then he tells the woman at the well, I can forgive you no matter what your past is. Everyone has a story that matters, but only if you tell the story. Your story matters because it's God's redemptive story. I love in Revelation chapter 12 when it says that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. And this is what it says about that. It says, they triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb, Jesus Christ, and by the word of their testimony. You see, you could argue with me all day long that God's not real, but you can never change my mind because I've experienced him. I know he's real. I feel it. I felt a change. Even as a a kid that's grown up in church, I know God. I have felt him. That's, That's my testimony. Our story, our testimony has the power of God in it, which is why it has to be shared. And we don't have to pretend that everything's perfect either, church. This is actually a good thing for all of us to hear. Your doubts, your frustrations can be used to help spur other people on. I remember what uh, the psalmist said, that he remembers our framework, that we're merely dust. He understands that we're flawed. What you have experienced can and will connect with people. You just got to find those people. And God, it's usually the Holy Spirit that opens those doors, and all of a sudden you're like, man, I have a connection with this person that I can use for God's glory. Like, I, I think about my life. I can't really connect with somebody that's ever had an addiction. I've never drank, I've never smoked, I've never tried drugs. So for me, even though my story matters, I'm not really connected in that way. But some of you have a redemptive story where God took you from addiction that used to define you and made you who you are today. You have a connection with so much of the world that I would never have the ability to touch. The question is, will we use that for his glory? You can use your story for God's redemptive story to connect with and empathize with others in a way that I never could do. And then you can go and tell them about the greatness of what Jesus does, that he redeems lives. Church, that's good, that he redeems broken lives. You can walk with them. You can encourage them. You can be to them what they so desperately needed when they were stuck or when you were stuck in addiction. You can be that person 
that fights for them. I truly believe that no matter how negative our life has been, no matter how many things that we've went through, that all of it can be used for his glory. I'm not saying that's easy either, but I believe it can be. I believe we can use it for his power to do the miraculous. Many of us in this room were raised in church. Matter of fact, if you were raised in church, just raise your hand. Just look around. There's not very many people who weren't raised in church. This area that we live in up here is a, is a predominantly religious area, which means you probably were raised in church. Um, those of you who have never had a season where you really wondered from God, or at least you did, but you're kind of back now, can easily think our story isn't as powerful or as effective as those stories that we know about the upside-down life transformation where God just does this awesome and miraculous thing. But I'm here to tell you your story is just as powerful. Because right here in this area, there are all kinds of people that were raised in church that no longer go to church. They've struggled with the same things that you've struggled with. You can have empathy to walk through them uh, on a daily basis. You've walked with the ups and downs of the church. The good, the bad, the ugly. The church splits, the the messy church hurts. You have plenty of unanswered questions pertaining to God. The unanswered questions that you've desperately tried to figure out in your head and you've got nothing. It's not easy to go through life and live up to God's standards, which is how we were raised. And so you felt that. And you, we are often the ones who struggle with self-righteousness too. We will say we've lived a certain kind of life and so we want to hold other people accountable. And so we struggle with a weird pride. We have struggled with the complexity of scriptures. We have had plenty moments of doubts. We have wrestled with the evils of this world all the while wrestling with God because of this world being so evil. Oh, your story matters. Because they're doing the same thing. They just need to know that somebody comes alongside them and says, it's okay. Let's walk through this thing together. Let's do this together. You have a story, and it's the redemptive story that says you are not saved because you were raised in church. You are not saved because your, cha- your parents believe. You are saved because you believe that Jesus Christ died for you, and you have given your heart to him, and by grace through faith, he is honoring that salvation where you get to be in heaven. That church is amazing. Even while we struggle, in those difficult times, even when we don't have all the answers. I mean, I can tell you as a Christian, a lifelong Christian, there are plenty of times when I say, I believe, but Lord, help my unbelief because I'm confused. You know how powerful that story is to a world out there that feels like they have to have it all figured out first? What a lie from Satan, right? God can walk us through all of this who have had church hurts and you say, I know, because broken people lead broken people. It's gonna happen at some point to see a person who has devoted their life and yet still struggles in many of those areas can change someone's life. Who doesn't have great answers for all things theological. But they just wanna love people. They wanna show people that Jesus has changed their life. That story still screams of the greatness of God that if you'll use it to walk with people and disciple them. 20 years ago, from the pulpit, you would almost hardly ever, if ever, hear a pastor talk about their failures, their sins, their shortcomings, their insecurities. I can tell you that because I'm a pastor's kid, so I know. And so what happens is, is then they almost have to try to live a life of a lie and pretend like everything is good, which then, it's it's just a recipe for disaster because everyone has an off day. Can I get an amen on that? right? So some, at some point, somebody's going to get hurt because somebody has an off day that's a Christian. And pastors felt that to a, another level. So what I love that's happened in the past 15 to 20 years in the church world is pastors are being more authentic from stage. They're saying, listen, I struggle too. This is normal. Let's talk through this together. Let's love each other as we go through this together because this is not easy. I love Jesus. I would lay down my life for Jesus. But the pull of the world is very enticing. And so we have to walk through that together and we love people together. And it will change lives. Church, 
I wrote this down this weekend. It didn't come across as powerful as I was thinking in my head, but I love this graphic. Can you put the next graphic up here? Because these graphics are awesome. Comic book. All right, it says, The Redeemer, redeeming that which by the world's standards isn't redeemable, has been redeemed. Let that sink in. The Redeemer, redeeming that which by the world's standards says it isn't redeemable, has been redeemed. Because you insert Jesus into our life, and I'm telling you, everything changes. Your story still matters. Your story is still there. It just doesn't define you anymore. That's it. You're now defined by the cross. So I want to do this. I want to end with this. It's something you guys have probably seen through memes of some of the people in the Bible and some of their stories. I'm going to go through this pretty quick, but they're pretty, in, <laughs> it's enlightening. It also helps us feel better about ourselves. But it will also have the uh, scripture reference up there. Noah, the last righteous man on earth at the time, was a drunk uh, who slept in the nude. What a weirdo. All right, Abraham, the forefather of our faith, let other men walk off with his wife, not once, but twice. Sarah, the most gorgeous woman by popular opinion, let her husband sleep with another woman and then hated her for it. Isaac, almost killed by his dad, talks his wife into concealing their marriage. Jacob, who wrestled with God, was pretty much a pathological deceiver. Uh, Rebecca, the first male order bride, turned out to be a rather manipulative wife. Joseph is sold into his slavery by his brothers, then holds it against them, kind of toys with their mind before he forgives them. Moses had a stuttering problem. He was like, I can't do this in front of people. He also had an anger problem. He kills a guy. Aaron, who watched Jehovah triumph over Pharaoh, formed an abominable idol during an apparent episode of ADD. Eli, who ruled over Israel, was a hopelessly incapable father who lost his sons to immorality and untimely death. David, the friend of God, the one that says a man after God's own heart, concealed his adultery with murder. Solomon, the wisest man in the world, was arguably the world's greatest sex addict with a thousand sexual partners. With rare exception, and we've talked about the few there, uh, the exception, the kings that followed Solomon were just completely crazy. Hosea, an incredibly forgiving man, grappled with the pain of a wife who could be described as a nymphomaniac, just kept going back to sin. The prophets, even as they spoke for God, Struggle with impurity, depression, unfaithful spouses, and broken family. John the Baptist, I love this one. Uh, the guy that Jesus said is the greatest man ever born of a woman, claims that he is the Messiah, he's come. Then he gets put in jail, and he's like, hey, guys, you got to go ask him if he's who he is. Like, he starts having moments of doubt. Uh, Peter rebukes Jesus. That doesn't go well. Um, and then he denies him three times. James and John had a problem with pride and jealousy. Paul persecuted the church. Timothy felt insecure because of his age. Philemon doesn't want to forgive one's miss. The Bible is full of broken people being redeemed that are no longer defined by those things. Amen, praise God. Do you see, though, why your story matters? None of those things define those people. They're some of the people that we consider the who's who in the faith. The ones that were considered righteous, and yet all of them had a past. I love that the Word of God doesn't depict the sinful human condition for his, his people as being better than the rest of the world, or sort of better. No, it shows us in our depravity, and yet God still redeems. That great cloud of witnesses that is talked about in Hebrews chapter 12, or many of the people I just uh, read about, spurring us on, and they all had lives that were marred with mistakes and pains, and God redeems. I think about even right now in our, in our pop culture, I don't know if anybody's reading what's going on with Kanye. I know it sounds crazy, right? Can God use anyone? I think, I think the point is yes. Kanye's doing like full-on services. He said, I'm not going to do anything secular anymore. He's got pastors telling people that Jesus is the only way to Christ. They're doing, on, doing baptism like it's crazy. What's happening with Kanye? He's crazy. He may be crazy. He's proclaiming the truth right now. Justin Bieber left, Bieber left the whole industry, right, because he started serving God. Brad Pitt was a, a known atheist and just said he just turned back to his Christian roots and believe that there is Jesus Christ. God can redeem people. And you should want that. And I should want that. Your story is God's redemptive story. 
There's a world out there that needs to know about your story because it just screams of the greatness of our God. God's amazing grace that takes us from a sinner to a saint. And that word saint in the Greek means consecrated to God, holy, sacred. That's you. You're not defined by your past. You're defined by the cross. And that story changes lives. Can we use our stories to grow the kingdom of God? And I promise you the answer is a resounding yes. But once again, your story is meaningless if you don't tell it. Part of my story, three years ago today, some of you have heard this story. I said goodbye to my mom. I held her hand when she stopped breathing. I got the little reminder on my phone this morning. It brought me to tears. Mama's anniversary in heaven. That's part of my story. It doesn't define me. But what it does is allow me to now have a connection with people who have lost loved ones in a way that I never had before. To walk with them, to empathize with them, to love them through the very difficult time. Some of you, that is your story. We have that connection that our parents were gone too soon. Some of you have even a worse story. You've lost your child. Someone else in the world has that story, though. And they need to know that God can walk them through even the most difficult times in this life. Your story matters, church. You just have to share it. Let's pray. Lord God, we love you that... I truly do. I love the fact that you redeem really, really broken and messy, jacked up people like myself. That you come down and say, I won't hold any of that against you. You're my child. Let me change you. Let me walk you through this. Let's use everything that you've had to go through for my glory. Let me tell more people about the greatness of Jesus' blood that washes us clean. Father, for those of us in this room who've struggled with sharing our story, give us a boldness. I believe that the Holy Spirit provides that power to, to, to come to us and boldly proclaim the gospel, to share our story and what the gospel has done for us. God, may we do that ever so boldly like we've never done before. May we change this world for your glory, God. And we say thank you for loving us. For those, God, that haven't given their heart to God, they haven't given their heart to you, God, today, may you just draw them to you ever so softly that they hear your voice say, I love you. I pray that you would just soften their hearts to come start a relationship with you today. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. There'll be some people that would love to pray with you after here. Uh, if you haven't given your heart to God, we would love to walk you through that. You're not signing up for anything. You're not going to get a bunch of goofy emails. You're just going to get to be told that Jesus Christ loves you, even right where you're at. He can redeem you. If you want prayer about anything else, there'll be people in the back. But I, I want you to do one more thing before we go into a time. I want you to take out your bulletin. Come on. I see you. Some people just stare at me like I don't see them. I see you. Take out your bulletin. And I want you to write. And if you didn't bring your bulletin in, you have homework outside of this, okay? I want you to write down your story. I want you to write down your story, your testimony. And here's what I want. I want you to write it a few times until you get the kinks worked out. I want you to get it where you know it. And then I want to encourage you to do a brief story, a medium story and a full on here is my life story when God opens those doors. Because the little brief story and, and Meyer is the checkout lady's having a bad day. You've got 30 seconds to try to share your story. You need to know that. But there's going to be opportunity where God opens a door and you can share your full on life transformation story of what Jesus Christ has done for you and all the difficult times. They weren't easy, but man, they have, so you have seen God work through those things. You can do that. In 1 Peter 3, 15, it says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. You have to know your story. 
because it's his story. And it's too good not to, sh to share it with people. But do this with gentleness and respect. Why do you have hope? You need to know. You need to share it. You can be like, listen, this is what my life used to be, and now look at where it's at. Only God could do that. I want to encourage you to stand and worship with the worship team. Really go after God. Spend some time just giving him praise and glory and honor for what he has done for us because everyone in this room who are believers in Jesus Christ, we have the same story. It is God's redemptive story. So let's give him praise.